Welcome to another episode of Culturally and Technically Legal, the show where we examine the intersections of culture, law, and technology. I am your host, Josh Walls. Today, we have a very exciting and esteemed guest, Ms. Natasha Allen. Natasha is a partner at Foley & Lardner with nearly 20 years of legal advisory experience. She's a co-chair of artificial intelligence within the innovative technology sector at Foley & Lardner. She is also the co-chair of the Venture Capital Committee and a member of the Venture Capital, Mergers and Acquisitions, and Trans- Transactions Practices. She also serves as the pro bono chair for the firm's Silicon Valley office. Without further ado, we'd like to welcome Miss Natasha Allen to the show. How are you, Natasha? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. It's, it's great to see you. So happy we can uh, have you on the show. Uh, really exciting because I think you have so much information, so much insight into the legal industry and what you've brung to it and just your overall experiences. But before we really jump into things and conversations about that, could you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you've actually navigated this legal space and have become, you know, a partner at one of the, you know, most pristine law firms in the nation, and I'd argue even internationally. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what that journey was like for you? Yeah, I would say the the one thing I would say was that it wasn't linear, right? And don't expect that your your career path will be linear. Uh, it was very much taking opportunities as they presented themselves to me, recognizing that, you know, whatever I'd done in the past would be available to me. So take the next step, figure out what the next move is. Um, but I do think the biggest thing is, you know, your path will not be linear. Mine was not linear. Um, and that, you know, whatever opportunity you take, whether it's successful or it's not, make sure you're learning from that, right? So I do think if you do a misstep, it's not something that should hold you back from taking new opportunities. Think of it as, you know, I'm going to try this. If it works, great. If not, either way, what have I learned from it? So for me, my career was not linear what at all. At all. I uh, graduated law school a long time ago. You, you kind of gave away a little bit of my age by saying how long I've been practicing, Josh. But anyways, <laughs> um, I preserve well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But in terms of, you know, when I graduated law school, the economy was a mess. Um, maybe similar to what some people are experiencing now, right? There were not a lot of jobs. Uh, I was educated in Canada. So when we graduated law school, we had to do what was called an articling position, which is essentially an apprenticeship. That was the step you had to do before you could even go to the bar exams, before you could even be qualified. So that was a step that you had to do. Um, There were not a lot of jobs available, right? I could have stepped off and done criminal. I could have done something that I really wasn't interested in. But at that point in time, I knew I really wanted to pursue a career in tax. So I pivoted. I said, you know, look, I know I want to do tax. I'm not going to get an articling position in this area. So what am I going to do next? So I actually went back and did a master's, um, did a master's in tax. Um, And so that took me down the path of working in accounting firms, right? The professional, large professional firms, uh, because the... um, master's program that I took had a practical portion to it, right? So I could actually go in, get my hands dirty, figure out what happens on, you know, like an actual active basis, which I, for me is important, right? It's good to know the theory, but what is the actual work you're going to be doing behind that theory? So that parlayed me into these professional um, firms, uh, massive firms, uh, which gave me a lot of opportunities, right? I was work talking with, working with high C-suite individuals of large organizations um, just on the tax side. So that was an opportunity that I could have never foreseen when I started law school, right? I thought I'd do the traditional articling. I'd work in a law firm. I'd go forward. You know what I mean? I thought that that would be my progress. Um, From that kind of master's program, uh, I always still wanted to do the articling, right? I started out wanting to be a lawyer. So for me, it was very important that I finished that. And so I pivoted again. I said, look, there's no jobs out here in this market. What am I going to do next? I clerked at the tax court, right? I doubled down on the tax and I'm going to clerk at the tax court, get this articling position under my belt uh, so that I have freedom, right? Freedom to then work wherever I need to work and do whatever I needed to do. So that's kind of how I transitioned a bit. But I think trying to figure out, people always ask, well, how did you get from tax to like (laughs) M&A? So for me, again, being practical is very much however how I've always kind of um, run my career. Uh, I think it's always, I always think of it as a dual track, right? Have a backup plan, but also just being practical. So a lot of, you know, tax attorneys are criticized for not being practical, right? Being very theoretical, not knowing how to apply whatever's in the, um, 
the the legislation to actual transactions to be business focused. So I always did a parallel between tax and m a right? Because those two worlds merge very frequently, right? Um, so I was able to get the practical, okay, this is how a merger transaction works. And this is how tax can help in, um, you know, kind of inform the merger folks, like kind of the transactional folks, what they're doing. So I always had a dual track of tax and m a So then that gave me options, right? When I fast forward to the U.S., uh, maybe tax was not available right away. I do. I did start an uh, actual another master's of tax at Georgetown, but that's another story. Um, but, wow. you know, I was kind of like, you know, let's just see uh, where m a took me. So it gave me options, right? It gave me the ability to flex either my tax muscles or gave me the ability to be like, look, I can do m a as well because I was trained in both. Um, so again, not linear. Who, you know, who knew which would take me where, uh, but it gave me opportunities and the ability to have exposure to different things so that I could flex whichever muscle I needed to flex at that time. The other thing I would say to folks is that, you know, sometimes it's hard for individuals to figure out um, how to explain their their process, their, you know, whatever they've done in school, and how do you translate that into something that is relevant to whoever you're going to interview with, if you're talking about an internship, employment, or just like on an interview. I do think that the one piece of advice that I do tell people when I'm mentoring them is make sure you tell your own story, right? You never want people to come to conclusions about, okay, well, you did this because you did this. Always come with your own story. Uh, and that helps to draw people to understanding why you took the steps you did and why it got you to where you are. So that's something that I think is another key thing. So just to back up and say, you know, what do I think are the key things? Career may not be linear, but it's not an issue, right? It's not something that should be considered as like a downside or something that is terrible. Um, Make sure you open up to opportunities. Maybe they work out, maybe they don't. Regardless, always debrief and think about, okay, what did I learn from that particular opportunity? And the third thing is always tell your own story. Don't let people come to conclusions about why you did this or didn't do this and try to, you know, just have your own story that you can tell people concise um, so that they don't come to outlandish conclusions. No, that was a powerful, powerful response. Um, I think as you mentioned, that nonlinear path, right? And how you can learn so much along the way, right? Not saying the linear path is incorrect, but the nonlinear path is also an opportunity for you to just pull different things together. And I think in your story, you really share about, you know, how you were able to have this foundation of tax and M&A. For the audience who may not know what M&A is in reference of, could you briefly explain what mergers and acquisitions is uh, for people who don't know uh -huh. and kind of unpack it a little bit and maybe even provide an example of that? Okay, uh, so mergers and acquisitions are used kind of as one term, but they're actually two different transactions, right? So mergers are really consider it like a combination of two or more companies into a new entity or an existing entity. And back in Canada, the way we would think about it is think of two rivers converging into one is essentially what a merger is. Um, now, when you're talking about acquisition, it's just that. It's acquiring something. You're purchasing either the shares of a company uh, or you're acquiring certain assets of a company, right? Whether it be their IP, sometimes there's even aqua hires, right? Where you're hiring the talent. You're actually acquiring the talent of a company. But though, that's how I would delineate between the two is that we usually come out with the M&A term, but it's really two parts, right? It's either a merger or it's an acquisition. Well, no, that's good. And I think that's that's great to kind of have an understanding of. And you being in such a technology space, and it's obviously the foundation of this podcast is tech and law. Could you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about, you know, over the last decade or so, how have you seen, you know, the enhancements and in artificial intelligence, right? Or even like cloud computing. How has that changed the mergers and or acquisition space um, from your standpoint? Yeah, I think uh, for the better, right? I am very much uh, somebody who thinks tech can enhance the way we practice law. Um, virtual data rooms, that was never a thing. You'd have to go play with a whole bunch of paper, or go through files. So virtual data rooms are something that has evolved. All data rooms are, are virtual. Um, very rarely do you have people that actually go on site and do due diligence, right? So that's going through the corporate books and records of any company you're going to acquire. Um, we have electronic signatures 
there were back in the day, you everyone would get in a big boardroom, have a pen, sign all of the transaction documents, which I know sounds very antiquated, but that actually was a thing. And now you have electronic signatures, right? You send your signature pages around electronically and you can close virtually, right? You don't have to everyone be in the same room. Um, AI you're seeing is kind of permeating every industry. Um, I would say that for the M&A or even transactional aspect of it, it's being used a lot for doc review, right? So being able to pull out different uh, provisions, you can focus on different um, uh, topics that you want to have actually highlighted in specific agreements. And if you're thinking about this, right, if you are acquiring a huge entity and you have thousands of documents, and that's not an outlandish number. There are some transactions in which you are being asked to review thousands of contracts. It helps to focus on which documents you should be focusing on, right? Um, so that's way one way is like during diligence is how you're seeing like AI and tech being used to kind of help the process in terms of M&A transactions. Oh, uh, no, that's interesting. And, and could you also talk a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges we see in this space? Obviously, there are regulatory approvals, you know, uh, some confidentiality breaches that could occur, uh, limited liability issues, you know, IP issues. And as you mentioned, you having this expertise in cross, cross you know, border M&A transactions. What challenges, even the ones I mentioned or just challenges that you would kind of speak on overall, have you seen um, particularly in this space? Well, there's a lot evolving, right? There's a lot evolving, particularly with AI and the regulation of AI and trying to keep that under wraps. The Federal Trade Commission has been pretty um, active. Uh, so there's the uh, HSR Act, which think of it as like the Antitrust uh, Non-Competition Act. So the Federal Trade Commission has been very active in terms of updating what the filing requirements are, updating what the limits are with regards to when you have to report. Um, and so what this legislation is trying to say is that they don't want large organizations to take over entire industries, right? They're trying to keep things competitive within the uh, commercial landscape, right? So that consumers do have different options so that they can engage with smaller, larger organizations and the larger organizations aren't just swallowing them all up. So what the HSR does is if you hit your transaction hits a certain limit, you have to get authorization, approval, you have to do filings to ensure that you can actually move forward with your transaction. So there's been a lot of movement with the FTC in terms of the HSR Act. Um, so that's kind of, you know, impacting how transactions are working and people are just paying close attention, right, to these changes because it is significant. Um, there are limitation of liability, you refer to that. So that's a particular clause that you see in most documents outside of M&A as well, like commercial contracts have limitation of liability clauses. Uh, and close attention has to be paid to that because essentially what these clauses are saying is that if certain actions happen, we are gonna cap the liability, the cost of those actions based on whatever we put in this agreement, right? So you wanna make sure that this provision is not over encompassing, right? Um, Sometimes things shouldn't be capped, right? What if somebody was fraudulent? What if someone did an illegal act? Why would you cap that liability if somebody did something intentional? So that's something that, you know, as you're going through these um, transacting documents, you pay very close attention to, like what is encompassed in the actual limitation of liability versus what should be excluded. Um, you have... Um, you know, some uh, another trend that was gone and is coming back a little bit is you'll see some of these transactions have what we call rep and warranty insurance. So in any type of transaction uh, and in most agreements as well, the reps and warranties are probably pretty much you can think of them as promises. So the, the seller, the buyer, uh, whoever at a particular point in time are making certain promises and admissions to the other parties. And so usually you do extensive diligence, right? To make sure that whatever is being disclosed, whatever you're saying is a true statement, is a real true statement in the rep and warranty. But some organizations, some companies, some transactions are just preempting this by just getting rep and warranty insurance. So essentially that means if a, within certain parameters, right? Because it is insurance, so they do their diligence, they make sure that things are, are in order, but you don't have to go through the extensive diligence, right? You can rely on the rep and warranty insurance if somebody is um, breaching a rep. So there, those are just different flavors of certain things you'd see. There's a whole myriad. Like I think when you're doing M&A transactions, the indemnification provision is a key thing. Like how is are people indemnified? Who is indemnified? Um, 
and in what circumstances. So that's a key provision that you would look at in an M&A transaction. Um, and there are others. Um, some of these documents can be super big, like they can be hundreds and hundreds of pages. Some of them are very small. It just depends on the size of the transaction. Um, you know, whether it's a merger or it's an acquisition, right? Um, and just kind of what are you acquiring? No, I, I agree. I think that was that was a, that was insightful, um, especially when we you just I think providing that different perspective in M and A. Um, to switch gears brief a little bit, you know, prior to you joining Foley and Lardner, you were you know the partner and CEO of your own firm. Uh, recently, you were asked in an interview. Who's your favorite female CEO or who's the female CEO that you admire the most? And I loved your response. Uh, your response was Serena Williams. Could you share yeah, why you responded that way? Uh, I'm a big Serena fan. Uh, always have been. Love Serena. Everything she does. You know, one of my favorite movies is, is King Richard, where it kind of tells the story of her upbringing and how she becomes a successful tennis player along with her sister and her, her father's influence. But just... Talk a little bit about why Serena Williams, your favorite CEO, and just give the context to that. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of reasons. I do think that uh, previously I'd been asked, like, what is the number one holdback for women? And I said it was access. And I think what Serena has done is she has shown, first of all, created access for herself, right? Tennis at the time when she was coming up was not accessible to people who look like me, like her, whatever it was, right? So she had to create, her family had to create that access, um, but also showcasing to others that, you know, this is possible. So it wasn't only her access that allowed her to be successful. It was also showing other younger girls, other younger individuals that, wait a minute, maybe I, maybe it won't be tennis, but it could be something else that I can build my own access, right? So that I can get those opportunities, um, maybe taking the traditional route, maybe not, but I can build my own access. So I think that's the key thing that for me is kind of her personal story um, in terms of how it was to kind of build that access and to build on it, right? So evolving is another thing, right? I don't, I think I've kind of alluded to this in the beginning. I don't think our careers are static. I think they're consistently moving. I think they're consistently evolving. Um, and it's just being aware and understanding when you have to pivot, but her career has evolved, right? She achieved all the accolades in tennis. Doesn't mean that she's done, right? She's moving on to the next thing. She's a successful investor. She's a successful founder, right? It's understanding and recognizing when can I evolve my career? When should I be evolving my career? And putting those things in, stay in place to allow for that pivot at the time when she was ready, right? Nobody told her that she had to retire. She decided that she was ready to do it and to move on to the next thing. So that's kind of, you know, the main things, uh, other and motherhood, right? She did all these things and she has two young girls. Um, so that's why I picked Serena. Maybe people think it's unorthodox and I should have picked somebody else, but for me, those are the reasons why I thought it was very much, she was the one that I think is, is the one that is, uh, very, very um, inspiring. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I love Serena Williams, as I mentioned. And, you know, obviously we'll be letting you go shortly and just so happy that we were able to have you. But, you know, I think in that conversation of Serena and you, you pinpoint access and, you know, you were interviewed before and you talked about access um, as being the, the thing that was holding some women back in these particular spaces is access. Could you give maybe three points of advice that you could perhaps share with young women who are looking to create access in these spaces? Mm -hmm. I do think, I think you have to step back and think about, okay, where do I want access to, right? Access is a broad word. And what my thought of is where I want, what rooms or whatever it is I want access to may be completely different for somebody else. So I think always when I'm doing these assessments, I think you need to step back and think, what are you trying to achieve? What's your goal, right? Once you figure out, okay, I want access to, I don't know, boardrooms. I want access to this company because I think I'd be a great employee there. I want access to this person. That's when I think you need to be like, okay, think about your network, right? People don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are people who have done things or people who have achieved things. You just have to have the mm, bravery, gravitas, whatever, to go ask people for help, right? Most people, I would say, are willing to give help. Yes, you will find those people who are going to say, you know, too bad for you. Good luck. But I would start with 
who are the people in the positions or have been in the positions that I want to gain access to, right? Get the information from them. How did they gain access to those rooms? How did they do whatever they're doing? You know, that kind of, of discussion just helps to figure out, okay, what do I need to do to navigate? And then to make the decision, do I really want to access these rooms, right? If it's going to take X, Y, and Z, is this really what I want to do? Or is there something else that I want to access that maybe could get me to the same place, right? But I do think the the main goal, the main step is to step back and be like, what am I trying to gain access to, right? Like, what is my game plan? No, I agree with you. I think, you know, having that strategic game plan is so important. And I'd really like to thank you once again for joining us today. It was so great having you. Great dialogue, great Absolutely. conversation. Uh, definitely looking forward to staying in contact with you. But thank you again. And I really, really appreciate the time you spent with us today because you gave us a lot of insight, a lot of perspective, and I think great advice to kind of go out there and take over the world. Absolutely, please. I'm, I'm everyone's number one cheerleader, so. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I agree with that. I agree with that. And thank you for watching another episode of Culturally and Technically Legal. Today, we had a very esteemed, impressive guest, Miss Natasha Allen. Uh, be sure to be on the lookout for the next episode. Have a good one. Thank you.